The Bain Free Radio Hour. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afsharirab. Today we bring you part two of our interview with Howard Andrew Jones about his Bain Books debut novel, Lord of a Shattered Land. This is a sword and sorcery epic, which is part one in Howard Jones's Chronicles of Hanuvar series. If you didn't check, if you didn't catch part one, be sure to go check out our archive at bain.com slash podcasts. Let's take a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sean C.W. Korsgaard once again back with Howard Andrew Jones, author of our new sword and sorcery fantasy novel, Lord of a Shattered Land, first in the Chronicles of Hanuvar. How you doing, Howard? I'm good, thanks. So last time we talked, of course, about you, Hanuvar, what's it been like coming to Bane? This episode, I want to dig into what I'm sure will be a hard topic for you to talk about, the sword and sorcery genre itself. Yeah, well, that's going to be a challenge. A challenge to fit it in in one episode, anyway. Right. So, let's start from the beginning. You were previously one of the folks working at Blackgate, and of course, you are the man behind the mask at Tales of the Magician's Skull. That's right, I edit... Uh, I edit... Tales from the Magician's Skull, a magazine dedicated to sword and sorcery. And one of the few outlets that, no matter when it comes into the Bane doors, there will be a fight over who gets the newest issue. <laughs> For the curious, Tony always wins. That reminds me, I've got to give you a couple of copies of issue 11. Yes, sir. So, as an editor, what goes into how you approach the genre as opposed to as a writer? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I'm editing for a magazine, so you'd think that uh, I'd be making sure that it grabs the reader quickly as opposed to, I don't know, a book. But I honestly like my books to grab me quickly too, so that's not any different. You don't have, when you're, when you're getting a short story ready, of course, you don't have as much time in the narrative to get things moving, but I don't want to see a novel that gets that takes too long to get things moving. Although, I will admit, I'm more patient with novels than I am with a short story. So, you also don't have as much room. If you introduce too many characters, uh, there's going to be a problem with the short story as well. My God, I could take I could take an entire video on on short stories. How much detail do you want me to go into here? Give us a couple minutes. A couple of minutes. All right, so it has to hook me from the start. Uh, I have to care if you open with action, it can't just be a whole bunch of action um, that's not grounded. I actually have to care about the action that's going on. Uh, I need an interesting character. I need an interesting situation. Since it's sword and sorcery, I want some elements of the weird and wild. Um, there has to be something at stake. Uh, I want to be transported to some place. I don't want it to be some hopeless thing where everyone's, everyone's a jerk, everything's covered in crap, and everything's hopeless. Uh, I want there to be some bright spots. I want to be, I want to see some scenes of wonder and horror. Yeah. Now, the other thing I'd like to ask about the craft, at least, of course, with no doubt many of our viewers and listeners themselves aspiring authors, I always like to ask our authors on the Radio Hour, how do you go about your writing process? Is there anything unique you approach it from? Any tips for newcomers or even for blooded veterans of the craft? So, so over the course of, I, I guess I became a pro, I'll say I became a pro when I quit my day job, which is in 2011, and with my first book. And since then, um, my writing style has changed. I don't know how unique it is, but over the years I've finally found a way that works consistently for me. So I can describe that. Is, is that what you'd like? Beautifully, yes sir. Okay, so, first I have to have a character I love, or characters that I love, in a situation that I'm fascinated with. 
And since I'm writing a sequence of stories about the same character, I already have the character I love. I already have a setting I know. That's another important thing you have to have. You have to understand your setting. So given that you have those things, given that I have those things, what I do then is I develop thumbnails. I write down ideas that I have and I, I collect them. And once I have a thumbnail, that's when I begin to explore. I know a lot of people do exploratory writing. And I kind of do that as I do my outline. I call it a scaffold pass. It, what it ends up looking by the time I'm done is it looks like a bad screenplay. So since I play to my strengths during my, um, during my outlining process, and one of them is dialogue. Dialogue comes easily to me. So uh, I will write down the dialogue that I think of for various scenes, and I'll add in a few stage directions. And if the scene works, I'll keep it. If it doesn't, I throw it out and I try a different angle. So the idea is I draft an entire story or chapter, I guess you would call it. Um, and I work through all of the beats ahead of time. That way, when I'm later drafting it for real, I don't have to stop and think, oh my gosh, I've really got them in a, I've got them in a bit of a pickle. How will I get them out? And then spend three days figuring it out. I do that up front. I might spend... Since I'm writing about a really smart character, he's smarter than I am. But I put him in a tough situation, he has to think of the way out like that. It may take me a couple of days, but I've got it figured out on the outline stage. So I work out the combat beats, and, and here's where my stage directions actually in the rough draft do get more involved. I don't want to have to be slowed down to figure out how the combat scene works when I'm doing the actual drafting. So in the outline, I'll figure out the movements. Who does what, when, with what weapon, to whom. Uh, how do they avoid getting uh, hurt, or how do they get hurt? So I work all that out ahead of time. The plot beats, the mysteries, the surprises, uh, but mostly it's the dialogue. And once I have that all fully functional, uh, that is when I start typing it into the computer, because I, I write everything out in the longhand. I, I am going to be spending, once I start revising, I'm going to spend so much time in front of that glowing screen. I think it actually frees my mind up to get away from it. So then I will type it into the computer. And then I've got, I don't have a blank page in front of me anymore. And at that point, I start um, smoothing it all out, adding dialogue, improving things, and of course, adding all of the descriptions. Uh, I suppose the other thing I should say about the whole process is that I revise a lot. Uh, I read it out loud a lot. When I read it out loud, um, things jump out at me. And it's not like I invented any of these techniques. Um, but I, I lean heavily on that. When I read it out loud, word echoes jump out. Um, um, lines that are too long. So for instance, Hanavar uh, speaks rather succinctly. Um, I don't mean to say he's monosyllabic, but he's to the point. And when I read out loud sometimes in rough, rougher drafts, he says too much. Now, occasionally he will go into a longer speech when it's necessary to talk to someone or uh, someone really needs something out of him. But he tends to be short to the point. And so when I'm reading out loud in a rougher draft, it's like, oh, wait, I could say this in a simpler way. Stuff like that leaps out. Also, whenever you're, um, whenever you're writing these days, you have to keep in mind that a lot of people intake their fiction via audiobooks. Um, so when I was younger and first, um, first experimenting with writing, I really liked uh, some of the uh, styles where the dialogue is just, if two people are talking and they have different agendas, you can tell who's saying what just by what they're talking about, uh, very, using very few dialogue tags or other things. I mean, you don't have to use a dialogue tag. You can use said and, and, and all that stuff. Or you can indicate who's talking by having them do something and then uh, something in quotes happening after they're doing the thing. Anyway, um, since we have to be aware of audiobooks, I make sure that it's clear who's speaking. Because if you're going to be listening to someone reading this book out loud, and you've got a string of uh, dialogue said one after the other, I don't think it's as clear or as useful anymore. So you've got to keep that in mind. So we've talked about the craft. I'd be remiss if I didn't also uh, talk about some of your history with the genre. You are, for lack of a better way of putting it, the man who saved Harold Slam's work from dissolving in a garage. Well, I wish that Harold Lamb was even better known still, 
but um, so Harold Lamb was hugely influential on um, sword and sorcery and adventure fiction in general. He was one of Robert E. Howard's very favorite writers. And of course, Robert E. Howard pretty much invented sword and sorcery, right? Um, and it's not just that, oh, he's an interesting historical footnote. He was a great writer. He wrote swashbuckling stories of incredible inventiveness, um, surprises, mayhem. You know, when you recommend older fiction, a lot of times people are like, well, I, I bet that's interesting, but it's probably old. It's like, no, it, it moves a really cracking pace. And so I, I kind of stumbled upon them by accident. Um, and I couldn't believe how good they were. And I cherished the books that there were. And I thought that I had found all of them. And then in a footnote uh, to uh, one of his more obscure books that Els Sprague de Camp had reprinted, um, de Camp mentions in the introduction, uh, just sort of offhand, that uh, there were a good, there were dozens more of his tales that had never been reprinted. I'm like, what, what, what? I've got to find these. And when you hear about things like that, you assume, oh, well, they're probably deep, deep tracks off of an album. They won't be as good, and the best stuff's been printed. Well, the interesting thing about Lamb is that he's, he's really consistently good. And when I did get a chance to find these stories that hadn't been reprinted from the pulp since, like, you know, 1920, they were just as good as the stuff that had been reprinted. And keeping in mind, the stuff that had been reprinted had been reprinted in the late 60s. So it's not as though it was easily accessible um, to a modern audience anyway. And uh, I wasn't the only Harold Lamb fan left. There were other people who'd come upon him and like, why isn't this stuff available? Why has it never been collected? And we kept asking, why not? Why not? Why not? Why, uh? And, um, well, the weird thing is that I ended up being the guy who had the contacts to make it happen. I, at, that's, at this point, um, I, I ended up being, becoming an editor. Uh, not because I set out to become an editor, but because I... Uh, I, uh, the only job I could get when my wife and I moved to Indianapolis was as a third shift proofreader of technical books. It, was, it wasn't my dream job. I was reading, uh, I was reading technical books uh, at midnight and uh, proofreading them. But uh, eventually I, uh, uh, I moved up from proofreader to editor and uh, moved my way up to uh, various editorial flavors. And so I saw that Bison Books, University of Nebraska uh, Press imprint was reprinting a bunch of Robert E. Howard's historicals. And so, it seems kind of crazy now, I just cold called them. But I knew how to talk to editors, because I talked to editors all the time. I was there at Macmillan Computer Publishing, and I was like, hey, you know, I, I work for Macmillan. Um, I, happen to, uh, I happen to know that there's a writer who is very influential in Robert E. Howard, who has all these historicals that have never been reprinted. Would you like to see a proposal? And, the, well, they said yes, and of course, being prepared, I sent them the proposal immediately. And I'd already tracked down the uh, copyright holder as well. And, and there that is. And I suppose, you know, I was talking with Fred Malmberg of Heroic Signatures about this yesterday, because I don't think I'd ever told him this. Um, the, uh, the fellow who had these rare manuscripts was John Drury Clark, Dr. John Drury Clark, who was a science fiction writer. He is one of the two people who wrote Robert E. Howard to get uh, to ask him about Conan's uh, chronology and his future adventures, and that's the source of this wonderful letter from Robert e. Howard that is our only source today of what he envisioned to be the course of uh, Conan's life. That is the guy who had all of these, uh, not quite all, but most of my collection of, uh, of Harold Lamb stories saved. I purchased them from his widow, which is really cool. That means that there's sort of a, almost a direct line. I got the Harold Lamb manuscripts, the bulk of them, from the guy who got this great information from Robert E. Howard. Uh, I just think it's a really neat uh, way the circle feeds upon itself, or influences itself, you know what I mean. I mean, it's one of those great things. Writers always speak to other writers throughout the ages, especially when it comes to reprinting or collecting. I've been lucky to work with Bane's own Hank Davis on a couple of our reprint anthologies, one of which also out this month. They're here. Insert pub, you know, plug right here. And 
it's a thrill to dive through the depths of decades of genre history, of authors' careers, to find those obscure gems, the works that have never been collected digitally or haven't seen the light or touch of an editor in decades. And Usur saved the bibliography of one of the formative authors of the genre in its mere whole. That's incredible. Well, it was so good. I couldn't believe that it wasn't in print. So, so uh, imagine that you, imagine that you stumbled upon, I don't know, like the Three Musketeers and no one had ever heard of it. You'd be like, my God, this is so good. Gotta say, or suppose you were, I don't know, a Jimi Hendrix fan and no one had heard Purple Haze or uh, uh, <laughs> Crosstown Traffic. And, and here they were. You're like, you gotta hear these. I can't believe that no one has released these. They're that good. These stories are phenomenal. I couldn't believe that they weren't in print. And like I said, I wasn't alone. And it's not like I did this alone. I had other people helping me out. Um, and I'm just thrilled. There's now eight volumes that collect almost all of his uh, best historical fiction. And they're in print. And you can get them anytime you want. Um, what? 20 years ago, it was impossible to do this. And your knowledge and depth of that knowledge for the history of the genre and its authors. Well, it brings a pause even to me, the motor mouth. So before I do tap into that a bit more, I'd be remiss if I didn't get Howard's take on Howard. Oh, Robert E. Howard? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, he's one of my favorite writers. That That's, I think anyone who's familiar with me would get that. Um, so vivid color. Uh, incredible pacing, uh, wondrous imagination. He has the poetry just threaded through his prose. Um, he leans heavily on the verbs to do the action. Uh, he created iconic characters. Notice I say that S. Um, and his characters have more complexity than is, he's generally given credit for as well. Unfortunately, there's the there's a sense that Conan's this unthinking brute. Uh, and I, I've I don't know how that happens, but characters get diluted. The same things, uh, similar things happen with Captain Kirk, where he's now thought of as a skirt chaser, um, smarmy skirt chaser, and that's just, that's not the character. And unfortunately, similar things have happened to Conan. But, uh, um, yeah, Robert e. Howard is an incredible innovator, and, and he died so young, he was 30. I think I've, Larry Korea of all people, said that his death at 30 was the seminal tragedy of early American fantasy. Had he lived another 40 years, he could have been the American Tolkien. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. He he did so much when he was 30. I mean, think how much his, think how much more he could have done. How much more his writing would have grown. How much, uh, how his perspectives would have expanded. Uh, all the genres he could have explored. Um, how many more, I mean, how many more tales he could have given us that he had done so much by the time he was 30. Uh, it's just stunning to me. So yeah, I mean, I have a whole lot of respect and admiration for Robert E. Howard. Aside from, of course, Conan, do you have any favorites of his? Do you want the obscure favorites or do you want the... So, you know, it turns out he's actually capable of incredible humor. I, I'm not really a humor reader, but because I was exploring Robert E. Howard's work, uh, I read his uh, his Breckenridge Elkins stories, and those are really funny, uh, sort of tall tales things. Really not my cup of tea, and I still uh, grooved on him. And his Sailor Steve Costigan stories. I, I don't really read boxing stories, but those are those are great stories. They're funny, and the fight scenes are good. Robert Howard's combat scenes are. I don't know if he's peerless. But I don't know that anyone is better than him. There may be some people who have reached his level, but I, I don't know that there's anyone better. But, I mean, you've got... Uh, I think my next favorite may actually be El Borac, the, uh, the adventurer in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, as far as his series characters, um, there's a minor one named uh, Tulug... Uh, Tulug... I'm terrible with Irish. Uh, Double Brian... Um, and he's only in three or four stories, and that guy's great. I wish he'd written more of him. And of course, you've got Solomon Cain, uh, and you've got Cull, uh, and you've got Bran McMorn, and you've got Cormac McGart. All of these are cool, but I think 
my next f favorite of the series characters is probably Elborak. And there's no fantasy elements in Elborak. But I think that they're the most consistently good of all of the series characters. And that sounds weird because I do prefer the Conan stories, but there's highs and lows in the Conan saga. And there are several Conan stories that are better than any Elborak story. But there's a number of Conan stories that aren't nearly as good as any of the Elborak stories. The Elborak stories are all at about the same level of quality, uh, and that quality is really high. These are great adventure stories. And as far as uh, uh, standalones, man, his historicals are great. His historicals are just phenomenal. Uh, some of them are among the best uh, historical swashbucklers ever written. and. Uh, if you want my detailed thoughts on that, um, the Del Rey collection of Robert Howard historicals, I believe, is called uh, Dark Agnes, right? Yes. Yeah. No, no, it's called Sword Woman. Sword Woman is Dark Agnes. There's Dark Agnes on the cover. Anyway, the Del Rey collection, Sword Woman. Um, Scott Oden wrote the introduction to that. I wrote the afterword to that, and I go into detail about which stories I think are the greatest in there and why they're the greatest. And I also talk about... Um, Harold Lamb's connection with Robert E. Howard and how they influenced each other. So, Howard's definitely one of those authors you could spend a career diving over, and many have. Uh, before we move on, though, I, as a fan of his horror work, what do you think of Howard's take on Lovecraft? Well, what I love about Howard's take on Lovecraft is that uh, his heroes, instead of seeing the terrible thing and melting, you know, running in horror or being overcome, they may be freaked out, but they're going to try and take it on. And they, they realize they may go down, but they're going to die fighting. So, yeah, I like that. Now, during your first interview for the Bane Free Radio Hour, beside some of our other new to Bane authors, we asked each of you your favorite Bane title, and you pulled out an interesting one, Niftaline by Michael Shea. What is it about Nift and Shea that stands out to you in such a way? Well, Nifshia, uh, Nifs. <laughs> okay, let me try again. Nift is an awesome character. He's original. The reason he's original is because of Shia. Shia was an incredibly gifted writer of horror and speculative fiction. Um, the way he approaches his scenes, his, his beautiful descriptive prose, his incredible imagination, his, his chilling sense of horror. The guy was gifted. Uh, and I think he's definitely unduly overlooked. And it is time for him to be rediscovered by a new audience. I actually got to meet him um, two or three times. And I can't say as I knew him well. We just met at a convention and had some short chats. But he was an incredible gentleman and very kind. And I wish I'd had the chance to speak with him at greater depth. Um, he died too young. I don't want to say that he himself was young, but he wasn't that old, and he seemed to be pretty fit. Um, so look, I think he was caught in that, um, in that changeover when fantasy became kind of completely governed by epic fantasy, by the... Uh, by the big door stoppers like the Robert George stuff. I think it steamrolled sword and sorcery and other kinds of fantasy. I'm not saying that you shouldn't enjoy your epic fantasy or, or your big door stoppers. That's perfectly fine. What I've always resented is that it seemed to just completely take over the marketplace. It's like um, we have all kinds of cake, especially vanilla. If you want chocolate or anything else, uh, you might be able to find it um, over there in Milwaukee, but not here. That's kind of what it felt like. And I think, I think Shia uh, got hit by that. And I think that's what happened to Sword and Sorcerer uh, in general, except for somehow Jamel escaped. I don't know how he, how he continued to endure writing Sword and Sorcerer, but almost nobody else did. And I guess before moving on, as often as you get asked on social media and even on the Writer Dojo by Larry and Steve, as a man who knows the genre, are you up for a couple of rapid-fire questions about some authors and their works and why people should check them out? Absolutely. Let's begin then. Okay. Lord Dunsany. Okay, so, um, talk about one of the originators of fantasy. Uh, he 
I think when a lot of people approach him today, they might try one of his novels, like King of Elfland's Daughter or something, and sure, that's cool, but the, the really fascinating stuff are these gem-like short stories that he wrote. Um, Neil Gaiman is incredibly popular today for good reason. There's, there's sort of a, a sense in Gaiman where he just tosses off wondrous concepts effortlessly so that you read something and, oh, just this concept that's casually mentioned here could make an entire short story for someone else. Dunsany's like that. Uh, I highly recommend uh, his short story collections. Uh, they're incredibly short. If you read one and you don't like it, uh, it's over very fast, and the next one will be very different. Um, they're witty, they're beautiful, they're surprising, the imagination in them it, it truly is peerless. Um, it, and they're so readily available. I think uh, Project Gutenberg has them. If you don't want a beautiful, uh, beautiful copy of your own, you probably will after you sample a little of it. Um, now, keeping in mind, he wrote it in an older style, an older British style, but it's not un unapproachable. Pretty soon you get used to the language. You don't have to work hard at it because it's, it's, it flows so beautifully. He has poetry in his language. And like I said, the imagination is just stunning. Uh, I can't recommend him highly enough. Clark Ashton Smith. Clark Ashton Smith. He's another one I can't recommend highly enough. I don't feel quite as fond of him as the others, only because I can't read him in long doses. Uh, his vocabulary is so distinctive. Uh, his manner is so distinctive. He, he's, a, he's heavily on the horror end and the dark sorcery end of things. And I've got some friends who just love him to death. I respect him. I like him. I don't read him um, in, long, uh, in long segments. It's almost like, okay, this is a really rich meal. I like it sometimes a lot, but I don't want to read, I don't want to eat a bunch of it in a, in a row. And that's how I feel about Clark Ashton Smith. Uh, Dave Ritson's, Dave Ritzlin of DMR, for instance, that's his favorite writer of all. And he would probably be, uh, he'd be saying them's fighting words. But you know, that's my honest opinion. I'm not saying that he's a bad writer, just that for me, he's not quite the... C.L. Moore. C.L. Moore. Okay, so there's, there's another gifted writer. She has sort of a dreamy poetic style, kind of like a, uh, William Hope Hodgson, uh, uh, another innovator, a Northwest Smith, uh, Jurel of Joyry, um, and uh, she's one who I would recommend reading um, not all the short stories in a row for a different reason than Clark Ashton Smith. Clark Ashton Smith was incredibly innovative and every story is distinctive, although almost always dark. Um, uh, more can be a little bit rep repetitive in her themes, especially if you're reading Jarrell or Northwest Smith. They're all enjoyable. Don't read, um, don't sit down and read all the stories back to back. Read one, read something else, read the next one. Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson. Okay, Paul Anderson. So much great stuff. If you're only going to read one from him that's uh, heroic stuff, read uh, The Broken Sword which takes a lot of the themes that um, uh, Tolkien used and does different things with them, and they weren't really aware of each other. They were just both doing the northern thing. He also did some really great historical fiction, and I think a lot of Bane readers are probably aware he did some great space opera and military stuff. Fritz Lieber. Oh, Fritz Lieber. Lieber. Right. So far from the Grey Mouser, um, Swords Against Death has a special place in my heart because it was the first legit sword and sorcery I ever read uh, when I went to the bookstore uh, looking for appendix in. I mean, I also read uh, Moorcock and um, Zelazny, but those Zelazny isn't quite classic sword and sorcery. And Swords Against Death, Fritz Leiber, that's, that's his greatest of the Far From the Grey Mouser books right there. So Far From the Grey Mouser are, are, are these two rogues um, who wander the streets of Lankmar, getting into trouble. Uh, and having wild adventures. And yes, I, I truly love about half of the Fawford and Grey Mouser stories. Um, I like a lot of Liber's writing. If you're going to try them, uh, try Swords Against Death or Swords in the Mist. They were written out of order and later assembled in chronological order, so you don't need to start with book one. A lot of people punch out on book one because it's full of stories he actually wrote later. Um, start with the second book, um, with the stories they wrote earlier, and you'll probably be as enchanted with them as I am. 
Jack Vance. Oh, wow. Okay. See, I keep talking about Vivid Imagination. There's a guy. Um, he could just invent amazing cultures and societies more convincing in their weirdness than anyone else. And if you're going to start with him, so the fallback is Dying Earth. Uh, a lot of people, when I recommend Sword and Sorcery, they want heroes or rogues. And the thing about the Dying Earth is that it's got this character, Kujul the Clever, or Kugel, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Um, and he's not a nice guy. And they're more mordantly funny than adventure stories, so they're a different feel. So if you go in thinking you're going to get adventure stories, uh, they're, they're kind of like caper stories. Um, if you want to read something with the same power of uh, society and culture and weird imagination and, and, and a lot of forward momentum, but you want a hero, read Jack Vance's um, uh, Planet of Adventure sequence. There's four of those, and they're short novels, so you can get them in an omnibus that's probably about the size of one George Martin book. Um, and they're, they're Sword and Planet, too, but Sword and Planet is so closely related to Sword and Sorcery. It's like, okay, there's a guy on a planet. He's stranded there because he got there in a spacecraft, but he's got to survive with his wits and a sword. Maybe he's got a ray gun with a couple of shots left. But, it, you know, it's basically, it's basically Sword and Sorcery. Speaking of Sword and Planet, Leah Brackett. Oh, yeah. Okay, Lee Brackett's another one of my very favorites. I mean, I've liked all of these people that we've been talking about, but Lee Brackett, she was great. Um... One of the reasons she's not as, as much read these days is because she was writing in a solar system that still had an inhabitable Mars. You know, Venus was a jungle planet. Uh, Mercury had a breathable atmosphere in its twilight zone. All that older science fiction stuff. Uh, and as long as, I, I don't know why, people could believe in aliens and elves, but we can no longer pretend, oh, what if Mars had a breathable atmosphere? But wow, so she, she brings this hard-boiled atmospheric to her uh, sword and planet in her space opera. And her space opera overlaps with her sword and planet. Sometimes her space opera has sword and planet elements. So these genre lines are really fuzzy. Um, she was writing about characters who were like Han Solo or, or Malcolm Reynolds or had a Firefly vibe so many decades before that stuff ever existed. Uh, and her great character is uh, Eric John Stark. Uh, so you can read, there's three Eric John Stark novels, but I don't even think they're quite as good as the three Eric John Stark novellas. Uh, anyway, beg, borrow, or steal her work. Try and find a copy of her short novel, um, uh, The Sword of Rhiannon, also known as uh, Sea Kings of Mars. Michael Moorcock. Michael Moorcock. See, this, this whole industry is full of innovators. There's one there who took the Conan ideas and inverted them. What if we had this weak guy who was dependent upon a substance and a sword? Uh, yeah, the, the Elric stuff, the Corum stuff, the Hawkmoon stuff. Um, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, so I would say start with the first Elric book. Um, go there. My first exposure to Moorcock was reading the, uh, the, the first three Corum novels. Uh, God, what was the first? The, the, was it the Duke of, the Duke of Swords? I, I, I don't know. Now I've got him in an omnibus. Um, but the Corum stuff's really cool, too. So the Hawkmoon stuff. Uh, another, another innovator who's still active, thank God, doing new, new Elric stories. Charles Saunders. Uh, now, Charles Saunders, uh, I actually knew. I got to correspond with him. We exchanged, we exchanged emails. Um, I would say he was a friend of mine. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't close friends. We didn't exchange that many emails, but um, he said nice things about my first novel, Desert of Souls, and I definitely said nice things about his work, and I still do. Uh, I have that kind of sad sigh when I talk about his work because he needs to be better known. He was, he was incredibly gifted. Uh, he came out in the... Um, the 80s with, uh, or no, it was the late, it was the 70s, 80s transition era with Imaro, this uh, hero wandering uh, uh, a mythic continent based off of Africa and African legends, uh, interconnected short stories. Um, Imaro's this, this wonderful character who you can't help loving and rooting for, um, uh, possessed of immense strength, trying to do good. Um, yeah. Saunders needs to be reprinted and rediscovered. Uh, he gave birth to the whole sword and soul industry. Um, yeah, 
he had a whole lot of bad luck with publishing. It just happened time and time again. And uh, we could have gotten a whole lot more work out of him if, if he just had better luck and publishing had been kinder. Yeah, it's a sad story. I'm glad it is still possible to find his books, but they need to be reprinted. Daryl Schweitzer. Daryl Schweitzer. So Daryl Schweitzer is another of the uh, uh, innovators. Um, I particularly like his uh, Sakanra the Sorcerer stuff. Uh, Mask of the Sorcerer is weird and wonderful and transporting. But uh, his short stories have, they're not, they're not uh, quite like Dunsany in the way they constantly toss off uh, other ideas that could be short stories, but they're sort of like Dunsany in that they're these compact little gems, some of which are wonderful, uh, many of which are wonderful. Uh, and I like reading his short story collections quite a lot. You're never going to know what you end one, what the next one's going to be like. Carl Edward Wagner. Carl Edward Wagner. Now there's a guy on the horror side of the spectrum, another innovator. Maybe I should stop saying that word or just assume that all these people are innovators. Um, with his Kane character. He called it sort of what, acid gothic is what he called it. Right? But it's, it's in the sword and sorcery genre. Um, and some of those are really amazing. Cain is such a memorable character. Uh, he's not a good guy. Sometimes he ends up doing good things, but most of the time he's motivated for interests that might not line up on the side of the angels. But he's a fascinating character. If you can't have a good character that you're rooting for, then make your character fascinating so that he's interesting to watch as you go through the pages, and Wagner does that. Tanith Lee. Tanith Lee. Wow. Well, there is someone who's sparkly and effervescent and... Uh, also dark, and who has this incredible command of prose and poetry. Um, the Flat Earth stuff is amazing. Uh, I really like her work. I'm not always wild about her plotting. I like her more at the sentence level than on the, um, than on the plotting level. But some people love her above all, you know, to each their own. I, I definitely love reading her. I, um, I think I like the Flat Earth stuff the best. Keep in mind, though, that, uh, it's, it's not even PG-13. Some of the Flat Earth stuff is a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit risque. So, go in, go in with, blind, uh, with blinders on. All right, go on. Roger Zelazny. Okay. So, there's another one of the door openers for me in speculative fiction. Um, the first thing I ever read by him was the original Chronicles of Amber. And between that and um, Swords Against Death, those are the first two near modern fantasy at the time for me when I was reading as a kid. Uh, and I'd been reading mostly space opera uh, and science fiction up until that point. And those things sh shifted my course right there. Uh, Roger Zelazny, what can I say? I read the original Chronicles of Amber so many times, probably nine or ten times. And it's not as impressive now to say that because there's people who keep reading Malazan over and over, right? And <laughs> Chronicles of Amber, again, is about the size of one huge George Martin book. But uh, I explored so much Roger Zelazny from that point forward. Uh, yeah. So he's inspired by Vance. He's inspired by Chandler. He's inspired by... God knows how many other places, and he we he he puts it all together in, in this uh, vast um, melding pot, and comes up with these cool characters. I love his world building and the way the way there's secrets within secrets, and I love his character's approach to things. Um, I love his mystery and his intrigue. Um, I love his combat sequences. Uh, yeah, Zelazny's one of my all-time faves. And before we move on from the classics, we can't have Bane for Radio Hour and not talk about David Drake. Yeah. Well, first, first he's just in, he's just an incredibly nice guy. Um, the first time I ever went to a convention, um, at this point, at this point, I had already uh, been corresponding with him because I had contacted him to write the introduction to one of my Harold Lamb books uh, that I'd been editing. But. Uh, I'd never been in a convention. I, I had some author friends, but I'd never gone to a place surrounded by all of these famous writers. And there's David Drake. I'm like, oh my 
my God, that's David Drake. You know, it's like you're a little starstruck, right? And uh, he's sitting there at the table, the signing table, and I, I form a cue to go up and talk to him. And, you know, it, when you're at a convention, you have these badges and it's got your name on it. And uh, I get up there, and he looks up. Uh, he just finished signing something, hands it to someone else. He looks up and goes, oh, hi, Howard. Which was, it was just so great. Uh, firstly, he remembered me, and of course he'd remember me. We'd, be, we'd correspond a little bit. Um, but it's not like we were pen pals. It was mostly just, hey, hey thanks, for, thanks for reading this. Here's the thing. Yeah. A anyway, uh, it just immediately shattered the ice. I was, I was no longer his word. I mean, I'm still a little nervous, but it's like, okay, I'm just talking to a guy who happens to like the same stuff I do. Anyway, so super nice. Um, he loves a lot of the same stuff I do. And I always took strength from, um, from his betrayals of ancient Rome in his fiction. Uh, and I love, I love so much of his work, um, especially the way he, he works with the military and brings them to life. Uh, and I know that if his career had gone slightly differently, he might have continued into the whole sword and sorcery uh, and sort of uh, military ancient history stuff that we probably would have seen even more of it. Uh, and I almost wish we had because that's where my greater love lies more than, uh, more than the epic fantasy and the military science fiction. Don't get me wrong, I do like some military science fiction, but as you can probably tell from talking to me, I spend most of my time reading uh, historical stuff at Sword and Sorcery. As if the past 20 minutes and the college level overview of the genre isn't an indication, but we've spoken plenty about the genre's past. I, I'm rather proud to say its future, especially at Bain Books, looks rather brilliant. I mean, in addition to your own Hanavar series, where the proud home of Larry Correa and both the novel he's writing series with St Eve Diamond, Servants of War, and his Forgotten Warrior saga. This year alone, we've seen the debut of Tim Akers' Wraithbound, your own Chronicles of Hanovar, a new Indrajit and Fix collection from Dave Butler, and Rhymer by Gregory Frost. I mean, that's an incredible collection, not just of sword and sorcery fantasy, just that's a lot of talent and possibility and excitement in one place, isn't it? It really is. And you know, one of the problems with being so, um, so connected with the older stuff is sometimes I forget to come out and read the newer stuff. Um, and I've also been doing a whole lot of historical research and uh, you may have mentioned I've been writing a whole bunch of Hanavar. So I haven't been reading as much of the modern stuff uh, as you'd think I would be. Um, so it's been delightful to come out and begin to explore. The first thing I got handed was uh, uh, Tim Aker's Wraithbound, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, it's kind of like a more cocky take on, um, on, on an epic fantasy. It, uh, it goes into some really dark, inventive, pardon me, really dark, inventive places. Really good pacing. Uh, I can be a little bit down on, uh, on epic fantasy sometimes because of the pacing, but uh, not with Tim Anchors. So if you haven't picked up Wavebound yet, definitely do it. And I think the second thing I was handed was the Interjet and Fix books. Uh, and I've read one of those now. Uh, and I talked about Vance and I talked about Liber. Well, this is this, this really awesome mix of uh, sort of Vancean world building with all of these weird cultures and the vivid imagination um, with Liber-like heroes, this duo, except that they're kinder than Liber. And um, there's, there's Vancean humor, but it's not as mordant as uh, Vancean humor. It's... Um, they're good guys, and they're having good adventures, and they're trying to do the right thing, and the banter is cheery and pleasant, uh, and I think they need a much wider audience than they've managed to find so far. I I'm really disappointed uh, when I mention them to my uh, fellow uh, fans of the genre that they haven't read it yet. I'm like, you haven't? Go read it! And then, I have just started uh, The uh, Son of the Black Sword. I'm about 70 pages in, and I'm really groovy on it. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing what happens next. So uh, keep it up, Larry. I look forward to seeing more. And I have not yet uh, started uh, Rhymer at all. I have uh, engaged with uh, Dr. Frost. Uh, 
I really enjoyed interacting with him in that interview. He seems like a really cool guy who knows his stuff. I look forward to reading Reimer. And at least one thing, as not just an editor at Bain, a fan of Sword and Sorcery, but as a reader, it's exciting that this long tradition of Sword and Sorcery is continuing at Bain with these authors, and there well could be a new generation of fans of the genre that look to Indrajit and Fix, Thomas the Rhymer, Ray Calfanis, Ajok Vidal, to Hanavar, the same way that we look to Conan, to Elric, to Kane. That's got to be an incredible feeling as a lover of the genre and one of its modern champions. I would really like that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think, like I said, I don't bear ill will toward epic fantasy, but I resent the fact that it it steamrolled the marketplace. And I, I'm not really sure all the ins and outs of how that happened, but I hate that uh, the heroic fiction uh, and the faster-paced stuff um, disappeared. And I think people, people are hungry for it. There's people uh, who've been writing it all along for the last quarter century. Uh, and I hope that what we're about to see is a big resurgence of interest in this stuff. I, I would love to be involved in that. Well, I'd have to say, Howard, as far as the tip of the spear goes, Hanavar is a damn bold strike in that direction. Well, thank you for that. Here's hoping that, uh, here's hoping that uh, the tide is rising and all of these boats will get lifted. Your lips to the reader's ears. Now, as we bring things to a close, where can people find your, well, of course, your book that's out this month, Lord of a Shattered Land. Give them the pitch one more time. You, you want the whole pitch again? The quick one. The quick one. All right. It's sort of like uh, the adventures Aragorn would have if Sauron had won, or Captain America versus the Roman Empire. And someone else, uh, what was that little thing? It was um, John Olfert wrote in one of the reviews. It's sort of like uh, if... Uh, if Prince of Egypt was cast with Denzel Washington's version of the Equalizer playing Moses. <laughs> and that is out this month on Bain.com and everywhere fine books are sold. Now, I have to, of course, as a fantasy fan, I always hate waiting for that, that next book. How long will people be waiting for the second Hanavar book? It's going to be a long time, almost two months. Two whole months. I, I don't know how you're going to be able to do it. That's right, folks. The City of Marble and Blood will be out this October, and you will hear all about that from Howard himself back on the Bane Free Radio Hour in October. In the meantime, any closing words, Howard? Find a way or make one. This has been Howard Andrew Jones. Thank you for sitting down with us on the Bane Free Radio Hour. Always a pleasure. And this is Sean C.W. Korsgaard, signing off. And now we bring you our audiobook serialization of Tinker by Wynne Spencer. Inventor girl genius Tinker lives in a near-future Pittsburgh, which now exists mostly in the land of the elves. She runs her salvage business pays her taxes, and tries to keep the local ambient level of magic down with gadgets of her own design. When a pack of wargs chase an elven noble into her scrapyard, life as she knows it takes a serious detour. Tinker finds herself taking on the elven court, the NSA, the elven interdimensional agency, technology smugglers, and a college-minded xenobiologist as she tries to stay focused on what's really important, her first date. Armed with an intelligence the size of a planet, steel-toed boots, and a junkyard dog attitude, Tinker is ready to kick butt to get her first kiss. The Foo Dogs chased her in her nightmares. Only they kept changing. One moment they were great cats. Another moment huge dogs. Other times, Chinese dragons, coiling through the scrap like giant poisonous snakes. She ran her legs heavy as if she waded through mud. Suddenly the dream changed. Windwolf rocked her, warm and gentle as her grandfather's arms. His voice rumbled soft comfort into her ear. The foo dogs, she gasped, 
looking about wildly. The dream room held nothing more dangerous than shadows, a chair beside the bed, a low table with a pitcher of water and glasses. They are all dead, he murmured, stroking her back. She clung to him as the dream wanted to slide back to the monsters in the scrapyard, the edges of the room blurring into heaps of metal. Don't let go. I will not. She worked at forcing her dreaming to focus on him. She thought she heard the slither of scales over steel and whimpered, burrowing into his hair. Easy. You are safe, Windwolf stated calmly. I will let nothing harm you. Think of Windwolf. She ran fingers through his hair, found his ears and traced their outline. She investigated their shape and texture, the slight give of the cartilage, the softness of the lobe, and the intricate coil of inner part versus the firm, stiff points of the ear tip. After a few minutes, he gave a soft moan and caught her exploring hand. He moved it to his mouth, kissed her fingertips, the palm of her hand, and then ran his tongue feather light over the pulse point on her wrist. Who would have guessed that would feel so good? She would have to try it awake sometime. She gazed at him, stunned again by the beauty of his eyes. I don't think I've ever seen anything so blue. Cobalt, maybe. My eyes? Yes. He studied her solemnly and then said, Your eyes are the color of polished walnut. Is that good? This dream wind wolf looked at her with gentleness that she wasn't accustomed to from him. Your eyes are warm and earthy, and yet strong enough to face any adversity. Oh, wow. You like my eyes? I like all of you. You are pleasing to look at. Now she knew she was dreaming. Yeah, right, with my hair and my nose. She twanged her nose a couple of times. It was numb, just like when she was drunk. Windwolf's nose, of course, was perfect. She traced her fingers over the bridge of his nose. Just right. I find your hair appealing, perfectly dreamy Windwolf said. You do? It is very pure. I thought elves liked long hair. She tugged on a short lock to illustrate that hers was anything but long. There is beauty and functionality that makes fashionable seem jaded. In our case, fashionable has passed traditional and become something nearly geological. She pondered this for several minutes before realizing that he meant that the length of hair in elves was set in stone. Sounds boring. I am not sure if it is lack of courage or lack of creativity that dictates the length of elfin hair. Unlike you, there is a notable shortage of both in our women. Me? You are the bravest woman I have ever met, as well as the most intelligent. I'm brave? When? Fearless. Tinker blew a raspberry. Hell no, I was scared a lot in the past. How long had it been since Windwolf came over the fence, disrupting her well-ordered life? Days. At least it seemed like days. She could remember at least two nights, but the number of meals and periods of sleeping didn't add to anything reasonable. I only did what had to be done. And that is true courage. As you pointed out, without you I would have died many times over. Indeed, I hazard a guess that of all the people of Pittsburgh, humans and elves, you alone had the intelligence and fortitude to keep me safe. It was such a weird dream. The edges of the room slipped in and out of focus, and she felt too light and bold. It was like she was drunk, only usually then her limbs felt huge and needed effort to move them about. Her hands now kept adventuring off on their own, exploring Windwolf. His fingers proved to be long and slender, with the cleanest fingernails she'd ever seen. Of course, everyone she knew spent a good amount of time with their hands in dirt or engine grease. Under a loose silk shirt of moss green, only faint silvery scars remained where the foo dogs mauled him. Why did the wargs attack you? Who wanted you dead? I do not know. I have many enemies. Other clans are envious of the Wind Clan's monopoly on the Western lands, and within my own clan, many consider me a dangerous radical. This, though, was not a simple political assassination. This was pure madness. 
two loose monsters that kill everything in their path. I cannot imagine any of my enemies attacking me in such a cowardly method. Someone has? Yes. Who remains a mystery? There seemed to be some barrier that she had breached. Normally she would not think of touching someone, nor did she need to rebuff most people. A quick hug, a handshake, a pat on the shoulder. It was like they all walked around with invisible shields, deflecting even thoughts of reaching out to another person. She had never noticed before, but now, snuggling against Windwolf, she noticed the lack of them. Like antimatter and matter meeting, their protection shields had collided and annihilated one another. Windwolf allowed her to explore his scarred shoulder. She found herself nuzzling into his neck, once again tracing the outline of his ear. She drew back, slightly in surprise of herself. I'm sorry. Why? She tried to form an answer and lapsed into confused silence until she forgot what she had been thinking about. He took her hand from his ear tip again. Does it hurt? she asked as he lifted her hand away. It feels far too good to let you continue. He nibbled on her wrist, delighting her. You are too pure to follow that course. You are not yourself right now. Who am I? You are Tinker, without her normal defenses. You are on the edge of sleep, still full of Sai Jin. I'm drugged? Very much so. She considered her body. Yup, that would explain things. Why? I did not want you to lose your hand. She peered at her right hand. Windwolf took hold of her left, opening it to expose a network of pink scars and anti-infection spells inked onto both the palm and the back. She flexed the hand, discovering it hurt faintly, deep inside. Thinking back now, she vaguely remembered he had carried her into the hospice. Oh, thank you. She kissed him. She meant it to be a chaste kiss, but it became something more. Suddenly it dawned on her that she was half-drugged, half-naked, and alone with a male in a bed. Her heart started to hammer in her chest like an engine about to throw a rod. Do you think you can sleep now? He asked, stroking her cheek lightly. What did he mean by that? Sleep, sleep, or sleep? Luckily, the elvish was a much more concise language. Saijiata? The act of sleeping? He nodded, looking inquiringly at her, as if the other possibilities had never occurred to him. Interestingly, the moment of panic had burned out all thoughts of monsters. Yes, I think I can. That was another installment in Win Spencer's Tinker, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judgowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Howard Andrew Jones, and good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.